namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sangang namasami So one of the main objects of sitting still with mindfulness, mindful, mindfully sitting still, is to for the development and the of samadhi. And of course, we can use mindfulness, you know, awareness, attentiveness, um, right reference, as a skillful tool in our day. Just uh, focusing what needs, what's appropriate, what's suitable to bear in mind. Stay on track. You know, keep to the plot, keep to the point, what we're doing. Hmm. You know, in the present moment, these are the themes of mindfulness, aren't they? Bring Bearing something in mind, bring it into the present, staying with it, not just dropping it, rushing off to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's got a lovely effect on deepening the value of experience. You really take it in. You savour experience. You're not just uh, skipping and, and jumping. It gives wet life a kind of a deeper quality because we really get into it a bit more fully. Mm-hmm. For his mind full, the mind is filled, touched, moved by what we're with. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, so we're not just tourists in this world, we're actually really in it, living in it, learning from it. You know, and in that case, this course mindfulness means because we're going to take it more fully in, it means we're more careful about what we do what we bring our mind to, what we bear in mind, because we're going to take that in. So you don't want any old rubbish going in. Mindfulness, in fact, you know. It's always associated with wise discernment over what's suitable to be mindful of. You know, one's relationships, one's virtues, one's purpose, uh, one's effects on other people. Uh, what brings good results? Staying with one thing, bearing something in mind, what what are the results of that? So mindfulness is associated with some pajanya full awareness <coughs> and deep attention. And then we come to sitting, and then there's the sitting is really a chance to... Um, and walking, something you do a very simple form, very simple form of of a living experience. You know, experience of sitting, very simple. Standing, walking, being in the body, in these very simplified forms. Because the simplicity of it um, allows the mind to more fully, even more fully, taking the qualities of that experience because you you're lessening the detail lessening the quantity deepening the quality and this leads to a, a gathering a collecting of energy that's called samadhi samadhi means gathered together or collected or unified and it's uh um, you know the causes of it are important. You know they're valuable. We're more clear. We're more focused. We're more discerning, and the results of it are important. The mind feels complete, happy, steady, balanced, grounded, free from 
worry and doubt, anxiety and restlessness, grudges and uh, ill will and inner conflict. So the causes, the effects and the process of it. Process is also equally important, very important because this is a when we start to learn something about the mind and about uh, what the mind's affected by thought um, feeling pleasant, unpleasant feeling and perceptions or impressions memories short short term memories um, impressions of things things that have moved us, touched us, affected us saddened us, excited us perceptions, these kind of mental or emotional experiences that uh, are like a walking, like we have an inner photograph album but it's quite chaotic it's kind of cascades like a slideshow of memories, impressions that's constantly being added to and and, uh, kaleidoscoping and this gives rise to a lot of Emotions and moods and mind states. You, know, you can just look from the outside, a person just, you know, sitting there, it seems okay. They can go through all kinds of anguish. Around what? Around perceptions, impressions that are rising in the mind. And sadness, disappointment, things that bothered them. And mind states. And then the, around that, the feeling of I can't do this. I'm stuck. Another perception, the impression of being inadequate or stuck or trapped. That's another impression. And this cascading experience, papancha, cascading of um, impressions and reactions and mind states. The extreme can be extremely uh, painful, confusing, um, disorienting. So the process of handling, steering, steadying thought and impressions, perceptions and feeling. Feeling of happiness, unhappiness, basically pleasant, unpleasant feeling, both bodily and mental. This is the process. And so in that process of it, you learn a lot about thought, how to use it, how to limit it, how to restrain it, how to direct it, uh, how to get it to stand on something and really investigate, mm. learn about perception, about its nature, and how to dwell on perceptions that are helpful, they're not all miserable, perceptions of, that give rise to gratitude, contentment, devotion, um, cheerfulness, mm. self-respect, you know, perceptions that give rise to compassion, you know, perceptions of you know the welfare of others, perceptions of um, you know people we feel respect and admiration for. So you learn how to garner and harvest skillful perceptions that tend to make the mind not produce a whole load of dissonant mind states but actually settle and start to enjoy and absorb and the feeling that comes from that quality of deep contentment so this is the process of it we understand what our inner world is made of how it needs to be uh, governed you know, governed sounds a bit heavy but need to be responsible for it uh, like you like you're a, the Buddha sometimes referred to use the image of a cow herd who inspects his cattle and makes sure there aren't flies eggs on the hides the Buddha often uses a lot of graphic imagery so you're checking out What's that? I don't want that one there, you know. Uh, it's kind of sour, miserable <laughs> memory or perception of another person. What's that doing there? 
do I do I need to stay with that? You know, and so you investigate. You, you know, keeping your inner house tidy. And if one's inner house is tidy, this is the most important because that's the only thing you've got. That's the only place you have. The rest of it, you are really just the tourist in this world. Just a traveling through. And the inner world is the one that's uh, your true home, your domain. That uh, you know, if you get that one right, then the rest of it is kind of extras in a way. <laughs> and you can see how if people don't get that right, you can, you know, the outer world can be pretty nice, pretty okay, and they can be miserable as sin and suicidal because of the miserable inner world. So this is a really important cultivation. Yeah, so, you know, when you use a Pali word like samadhi, maybe it sounds esoteric, or any word you use a word like concentration, you think, oh, I can't concentrate my mind, it's too, you feel yourself furrowing and tightening up to get concentrated, and you've got to get, get it done, get to this point when your mind is, that's really such a, such a um, damaging way of looking at it. Because samadhi isn't something you do, it's something that occurs because of skillful grooming, cultivating, steadying, you know, releasing, pruning, pointing the mind in a caring way towards what's helpful. And it's something that really should be something that everybody does, you know. It's like, you know, people do all kinds of yoga exercise and stretching the body and Pilates and things like that to get keep in good shape and diets and health things and food and stuff like that to get in good shape. Well, in your mind can be just a complete jumble. <laughs> and, you know, so you're not looking at kind of being a samadhi expert, it's just like when you clean your house, you're not doing it as an Olympic. You're just saying, keep your house clean. It doesn't have to be some kind of, you know, showpiece performance at the end of it, who's got the best one, but just you keep your house tidy. And this is your house. <laughs> and it's good to separate the different functions of mind. Then you can just start with what's most um, available. All of it really uh, has effects on energy, mental energy and why. There are many ways, different things you can use to develop samadhi. You know, just silence, a simple visual image, uh, a mantra, a word. But uh, the Buddha seemed to have mostly recommended using the body and breathing because of the particular um, energy that the body has when it's settled, has a very good grounding and uh, effect on the mind. Because the body energy is involuntary, you don't have to think it, it, it's there, your breathing happens by itself. So there's a sense in which it creates this balance whereby you can you can give effort and attention and energy to handling, but you're actually also your energy is, is arising by itself. That is, the body breathes by itself. And you're in some ways, you're also just receiving those impressions, receiving it, sensing it, receiving it, rather like water running over your fingers and you can feel. So the fingers are not numb and dead. They're there, they're... they're tuned in, how's that? But at the same time you're not having to pump the water. The water is running over your hands and you're feeling it. And you're staying with that. Mm. And that's the kind of, that's what breathing is like. You're letting it run over the mind and just staying in touch with that mindfulness of breathing. Now all the various um, you know, I was talking about thoughts and uh, feelings. 
pleasant, unpleasant, and perceptions, they all push energy around. You know, when we think a lot, energy is skating and rushing, isn't it? You know, if you have to think hard, you think fast, you feel your mental energy is whirring, speeding up. Mm. Uh, when you have a very st- strong memory or impression, your emotional energy is stimulated. You get quite happy and excited thinking of your friends or your relatives, or you know, when you find it stirs your emotional energy. Feeling also has an energy to it. That is, when we feel something, we're drawn to that, yeah, or we're repelled by it. Energy really pushes; it gets pushed by feeling. Hmm? You feel pleasant. You, you, the quality of pleasant feeling is something that has got a pull to it, and you're pulled towards that. Yeah. Quality of pleasant feelings are pushed to it, pushing away. You can feel yourself resisting and pushing away and trying to get away from pleasant, unpleasant feeling. Yeah. So it, it just pushes energy around, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so, really what the samadhi begins to make possible is to have one's energy not pushed around. So it becomes steady. And for that you begin to handle and tackle the mental functions, the physical functions, mostly the mental functions that cause energy to be pushed around. First of these is thinking. Thinking, what is Thinking. We all know what thinking is. Hmm. Let's look at it, consider it. It's, a, it's, a re, it's something that refers, isn't it? It's a referrer. You say tree. A word comes up. The word tree is not a tree. A literal a tree itself doesn't refer to anything. It just is what it is. It doesn't refer to anything apart from the soil. You can't abstract a tree. You know, you can't have a tree in your head. You know, but you, so you... But the word tree, the thought tree, refers to some physical object. So thought has got a certain reality to it, but its reality is just referential. It's a labeler. But it definitely directs the mind. Thinking directs the mind, so it refers. And when it refers, it points towards something, it goes there and it samples what it's pointed to. You think of... uh, you know, lasagna for dinner, and you point to that, and the image comes up. That image is called a perception. It refers to something, and then you receive the impression. You bring up the word, if you know what lasagna is, of course. <laughs> and then you get the perception, the image arises. And then you get, oh, pleasant feeling, well, that's nice. Yeah, that's how it happens, isn't it? Now, with a, with a thinking a lot, it can be so the case that the pointing's happening, but what's being referred to is getting increasingly foggy because it isn't the lingering. So the faster you think, the less time there is to linger in what you're thinking about, to really get it. That's just the function of the human mind. You know, I mean, you can certain speed of thought you're just going through the words and you're not really getting a feeling for what's happening particularly a lot of thinking is is pretty abstract like I've got to get this done by Friday what's that referring to? panic basically (laughs) anxiety you know it doesn't refer to anything like lasagna or a tree or a your granddaughter or something like that, it refers to a, a mind state of urgency. And we don't necessarily even fully acknowledge that. because You just get the feeling, the emotion, and we rush on, oh, quick, think of the next thing to do. So you get referring to mind states that just generate more thinking doesn't, without really sampling anything. So the mind is kind of, ends up generating its own world which is you know a world whose dominant features can be anxiety or depression or ill will or you know 
and doesn't refer to anything other than these mind states. Uh, and the thinking mind can do that. Yeah. You know, you just think of, well, you know, what are all the wars about? You say Israeli or Palestinian or something, you know, you know Muslim, Buddhist, you know, like that, communist. Da, 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 da. <laughs> what are you referring to? Just kind of feeling of, is that, are you referring to real people or what? No, referring to kind of triggered impressions, perceptions of aversion, fear, mistrust, bitterness, resentment. Yeah. So this process referring is the word vitaka, which is the pointing, and vichara is the word for the receiving or the handling. And with meditation you begin to deliberately point those and slow it down. So just, how's your knee? You say, hand, knee. How is it? How's your hand? Oh, yeah, I've got a hand. Yeah, yeah, of course I've got a hand. No, no, how does it feel? Oh, it feels okay. No, no, how does it really, do you really know you've got a hand? And the palm and the finger and the index finger and the thumb and the back of the hand and the knuckle. Get into it. Yeah. So we're just playing with things that have no urgency to them. They're not charged with urgency or achievement or prowess or got to get this done. They're saying, no, no, put that aside. This is why you have to be really aware of the, how programmed we are to use thinking to get something. Pro- thinking that's actually so used to being compulsive and anxious that we hardly know how to think without it. <laughs> You're just a... Play with it. Like, what does that feel like? Take your time. It doesn't matter what it feels like. You don't have to be good at it. It doesn't have to feel good or anything. Just what does it feel like? You're exercising the function of pointing and really getting. And you can feel your one hand, left hand. How is it different from the right hand? How is the palm different from the fingertips? What's the heat like? Is it warm? Tingly? Pleasant, unpleasant? Hmm? Yeah, tell me more. Get into it. So this is the kind of thing that is the exercising. And when you're doing that, because you're using that process quite fully with no particular agenda, no particular pressure, just to deepen and enrich a very simple experience for, you know, to allow, to just to get exercise and strengthen and amplify one's awareness of something, like your own body. And there's no, there's no mental, you know, there's no mental program in that. Not hurry up and get to the next one. Then you really, in cultivating, you've got to start draining all those programs and are associated with thinking. Get it right, get it clear, hurry up, get the next one, sort it out, make it work, get good at it, get the results, where's it going, what's the point of this, how are you doing this, that, you know, just, just relax that. You relax and yet at the same time you deliberately point, sense, feel it. You exercise that. And the result is your energy starts to steady. And when your energy is steady, you find, hey, that's strange. Energy itself is pleasant. It's not about sights or sounds or touches, but just the energy of the mind settled is agreeable. When it's not driven by fear, worry, agitation, ill will, so forth. So we're cultivating, cultivating. It's a caring kind of process, like growing grapes, or mm, you don't just do it, get to the next one. And that itself, you know, if it goes no further than that, that itself is really a, a good way to spend 15 minutes, you know. 
you can do anything more than that. Because you're changing the motor of the mind, you're changing the energy of the mind, you're changing, changing the programs of the mind, and the results are palpable. And when you find yourself steadying, that in itself, a lot of the jittering, nervous agitation, compulsive chatter starts to die down because, oh, you're touching into something that's got some real quality to it. And we tend to use the body because the body has this uh, uh, effect. It gives the mind somewhere to sit. And the mind by itself has no location. It doesn't do location. You can be, you say, Bombay, and there you are. You say, you know, 2003, and there you are. You know. It, you, you can be there. I mean, you're not really there, but your your mind is absorbed in that. You can think of something hellish and something beautiful. In one moment, you can be thinking about the World Cup. The next moment, thinking about your aunt's birthday. You go to Brazil and back in a second. Easy. <laughs> mind has no location apart from its own states and perceptions. The body gives it a location because the body's not in Bombay or Brazil or tomorrow. The body's only here. And that giving the mind a location has an effect. It's like, you know, if you want to stop the mad bird in your head running round, give it a tree to settle in. If you don't give it a tree to settle in, it's going to keep running round. <laughs> There's no way it can't. It's going to keep running around us. It's got something to settle in. So this body thing is the most obvious thing you can settle in. You could use a word. You could use just looking at a screen or sights or sounds. But, you know, there's something about just the sheer physicality of the body that has got a strength to it. When we sit, we do this. We just start to, you know, really place the body here, draw it up. Open the shoulders, you know, let the chest come open, relax the bits you don't need to be using, relax your face. You say you really work on it, you cultivate, and the results are good because you're starting to form a much more healthy relationship to your body than the relationship you form just by looking at it or thinking about it, you know, which is associated with the sorts of self-impressions about what one looks like or doesn't look like or, you know, dear, oh dear, that doesn't look so good, does it? You know, putting on weight or losing weight or going grey or going this, that. You know, you feel it. It doesn't feel grey. And there's a sense of care and respect associated with the direct experience of the body. So we use thinking. You know, and it's not incessant thinking, it's quite simple. And this, uh, certainly in uh, our lifestyle in the monastery, this is really part of our culture, is to use thinking like this. We use a lot of determinations. So, for example, we have a Buddha image, you know. And a Buddha image, you really treat that Buddha image as like that's not just a oh, Buddha image thing on the wall, yeah, it is, and the Buddha image is stop, you bow, you pause, you really, you know, implant meanings into things. So the mind is caused to continually pause and rest and get into it. That's a Buddha image, it's not just a piece of old brass or wood or whatever. So therefore, the mind stops. Hey, this is a time for deeper attention. When we are uh, our, our robes, we have to determine them. That means there's several things you have to do. First of all, you have to determine that it belongs to you, which you generally put several marks on it. And then you deliberately think, okay, this is this, this is a robe, I'm making this mark, this is my robe. And then you designate what you're using it for. This is an outer robe, this is an under robe. This is um, top robe, things like that. You have to name them. So you're making a very clear, 
designation of things. And this means that everything that you're, well, many things that you're with, you delib- much more deliberate thought about them. Not, you know, spinning out thought, but a simple thought, like this is that, that's that. Yeah, and our life in monastery is really structured around that. This is Saturday night. This is the observance day. This is the vasa. This is the retreat. This is seven o'clock. This is time for breakfast. This is the chore. This is the person who's looking. This is where the broom goes. This is, you know, everything's like that. It's quite deliberately placed. So that there's a sense in which, you know, you're using simple things like these, you know, which is the same stuff as everybody has, but the mind is caused to place itself firmly on an object and reflect on it. Food, this is alms food. It's not just, oh, I'm hungry, I have something to eat. This is alms food. It takes you like, you know, good 45 minutes to go through the food thing. And actually only about 15 minutes of it is eating it. <laughs> Most of it is waiting, queuing up, carefully putting it in the bowl, reflecting on it, giving appreciation, eating the food carefully. You know, most it's that. So you, something that is um, very obvious for people, but and we eat in silence. So when you're eating, you eat. You don't eat and talk. You eat. Um, so you deliberately simplify and unifying the mind around quite ordinary human experiences. Mm-hmm. I think this is all part of the culture that, that helps to create the basis for samadhi. If you do it, of course, of course you can still let the mind skip, you know, you're sitting there, instead of, you know, queuing up for the meal, you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow, while you're eating the meal, you're thinking about where you're going in the afternoon, or the discussion you had in the morning, you, of course, you, you know, your mind can still wander, but the, the nature of the form is to encourage that one-pointedness on what one's doing and determining it. This is for this, this is for that. I've relinquished that. So when you, even when you give something up, you have to determinedly, now I relinquish that rope, I relinquish that. Finished with it. It's not mine. You know, so you clearly de-allocate it. So this is a, you know, a simple way in which we use thinking to to steady, to simplify. And we make resolutions like, okay, for this next three months, I'm not going to, you know, whatever, you know, drink tea or something, or drink coffee. It doesn't really matter so much. Apart from the fact that one is making a determination instead of just the mind sort of skipping along. You're, just, you're, you're, you're steering it. You're making a decision about what you're going to attend to and you're placing a thought on it. So the next time you come to that thing, oh, no, I said I wasn't going to drink any tea. Ah. Ah. The mind is held. Oh. Yeah. So you're creating, thought becomes much more, um, there's more gravity to it. It's not skipping thought. Uh, And naturally then, Use thought carefully. You don't want to make a whole load of resolutions just because making resolutions is a good idea. No, we need something useful to resolve. <laughs> something you can do. Not something wildly optimistic or heroic, but something you can do that helps to uh, create a structure. And so then you can use it. <coughs> One becomes someone who thinks deeply, not excessively, but what is happens, they give it due attention, the mind is trained to take something and consider it deeply, turn it over again and again. Mm. And so the mind is constantly being asked not to skip forward to the next thing, but to stay and deepen into the experience. And this is the whole uh, hallmark of the cultivation of samadhi, of unifying the mind, cultivating the thought in a moment, in the 
moment, in the moment, in the moment. And we cultivate perceptions, impressions. Why we have chanting, for example, chanting a sense of harmony, a sound that's got a resonance to it. Our chanting's not great by any standards. <laughs> it's not operatic. But it, it, there's a certain sense of resonance and we're in something that's got a gentle, sonor, sonorous quality. And you candles, soft light, there's plenty of space, minimal clutter. Not, there's not a lot of stuff in the room that your mind, can, your eyes can, can snag over. And so it's, it's not busy. Uh, so you get a perception of stillness, steadiness, softness, calm, resonance, you know, using a meditation hall. Build up that perception. And then more deeper cultivations, we consider uh, our parents, our teachers, a sense of gratitude. We consider the offerings that are made to us with a sense of gratitude. These are helpful things to cultivate. One is encouraged to use thinking, to turn these over, to, to cultivate perceptions that are not associated with desperate need or inadequacy or complaining about oneself or, you know, things that just don't do the mind any good, but perceptions and impressions that give rise to contentment and gladness. This is essential. And it's for, this is something for everyone can do. You know, of course, we've all been dumped, we've all been cheated, we've all been bashed, we've all been dismissed, we've all been hard done by, we've all made mistakes, we've all blown it somewhere, we've all done, said horrible things, lost our tempers, been inadequate, lost it, got late, made a failure, made a flop, <laughs> this, that, or the other. <laughs> You can go out and dwell on that. And the funny thing is that these, these unresolved impressions can be the things that one's attention keeps going back to, picking away at. Oh dear, why do that? Oh no, no. he never said that. No. Something wrong with me. No, no, no. It doesn't end. You know? So is there something to be gladdened by? Mm. Mm. We have a breath. We have the freedom to breathe. <laughs> yeah. We have some space around our bodies. We all have space. It's not called asking anything of us. There's no pressure in it. When you breathe out, it doesn't ask anything of you. It doesn't care whether you've been good or bad. <laughs> it's not, you know, or what other people think of you. And just turning your mind to those perceptions such as that. Suddenly a different world can open up. Uh, feeling. <clears throat> you know, the funny thing, we certainly think of feeling as something physical, but mental feeling will always trump physical feeling. You know, that is if you're something you're really engrossed in, you won't notice, you, you, you know, the leg's gone numb. Something you're really interested in, you won't notice that you've got sunburn or something. Or, you know, you'll really be with it. The mental feeling, what one's really interested in, what one's mind is drawn to, will always trump physical feeling. Uh, that's the way we are. You know, to the point in which people can be quite oblivious sometimes. It's almost dangerous when they get really excited, you know, mountain climbing or adventure sports are so enwrapped with the, you know, the exuberant mental feeling that they risk their lives. So, we, you know, it's important to cultivate mental feeling, but then also keep relating it to the body. This is one of the 
you know, skills of, of the process of samadhi. Because once you begin to establish a suitable object for your for your reference, so body, breathing, silence, space, whatever your meditation object is, it should be that which you get a clear perception of, you feel comfortable with, gives you a sense of groundedness and contentment and you can get to it. So you've got that, that's your base reference. And then your mind goes to these disturbing moods and feeling and all, and you, and you oh, there's that. And you notice you're, you're agitated or you're unhappy or you're caught up with something. So wait a minute, what was the breath like? And you put the two together. And this is the way that the samadhi cleans the mind because you keep, it, like it drains the energy from the difficult state and it, you collect it back into the, your meditation object. Rather like, say, if you've got two rivers, you know, and they're going to hit each, they're going to touch each other. The one with the stronger stream is going to is going to catch is capture the other one, isn't it? Hmm? You got to if you get a little stream flowing into a big river, the big river, the current of the big river is going to sweep the water of the stream onwards. Hmm? So you're making your meditation object the big river. And that, instead of all your problems, the big river. <laughs> so this is the skill of it to keep, you know, referring back to that with this process of, of, of clear thinking or touching it with thought, referring back to it, till that meditation object has got the the power to it. That means, you know, you feel oh anxiety. How's that when I breathe? Uh, how's that feeling my body when I'm breathing? Uh, and how does it feel with a long out breath? And you find that the the quality of the the energy in the breathing and the body begins to dissolve the energy of the emotion of the negative emotion. It dissolves the energy of it. it breaks up the pattern of that tight, flustered, constricted state. And oh. Now, that means that then that whatever was you felt anxious about, you can review from a place of freedom by dissolving the energy of it, the, which has got a different pattern. Most of these energies are like constricted, constricted or agitated, tightening up, speeding up. Speeding up and tightening up is very often the case. Uh, yeah. What are you getting anxious or tightened up or speeding up about? Something you've got to do, got to do, really got to get that done. Okay, there's the energy of that, the perception, the energy, and then breathing through the energy of it till the energy of the, of the disturbance begins to dissolve. And then you go back to that topic, that thing I had to do. Oh, yeah, I'll get that done tomorrow, no problem. <laughs> or, no, I don't really have to do that. Oh. You're seeing it without this energy pattern, without it having the same effect. So you're able to review things in a much more calm, dispassionate light. This is not suppressing, it's, trans, it's transforming by changing the energy. You know, something you feel ill will for, you feel yourself sort of going sour and all these images and thoughts of this person's unpleasant and then you think you shouldn't feel like that, you know, after all, da 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 da, and, you know, they mean well and you know so and so, so and so, but you still feel ill will basically. And you're feeling the the energy of that, the sort of sour, tight, contracted, and breathe, just breathing through the energy of that. And you, so you accept the fact that you have ill will. But you don't condone it, but you have to accept it. Mm -hmm. Feeling it in your body, relaxing your throat, 
relaxing your chest, opening your chest, breathing through it. When the energy form dissolves, then you come back to that person you have ill will for, and you think, oh, you know, mm. Harry's got a real problem, hasn't he? He must annoy so many people. Poor guy, he's got to live with himself all the time. <laughs> he's, he's, out, he's out, you know, he's not stuck in my heart, causing me problems. And then your compassion arises, rather than anger and frustration. And you don't, you know, it, because it, that's, that's natural. You don't have to start being nice. To t- you don't layer or add the niceness on top of the difficult feeling. The feeling dissolves, and then quite naturally, the nature of the, the mind, when it's not afflicted, oppressed, constricted, twisted up, is open, kindly, compassionate, clear. That's, that's the truth of the matter. And that itself is just really such a wonderful thing to notice. It's not some personal quality like who's the nicest person here. We're all the nicest person here. When we free our minds, it's the same, it's the same quality. Yeah. And when it's not free, any one of us can be really pretty nasty. <laughs> and that's not personal either. <laughs> you can have personal takes on how that happens, what you do with it. But it's the same feeling, the kind of crabby, tight, hot, prickly, stirred up, soured. And then you're coming out of that. You know, we all more or less touch the same place. And you see, this is, you see, this is the mind. It's not personal. This is the mind. And it, you, it, you can have it that way, or you can have it that way. What do you want to do about it? You know. Well, you, once you get some recognition of the nature of mind when it's freed as being peaceful, pleasant, compassionate, enjoyable, not because you have to make it the way, because that's its nature, then you think, yeah, this is worth putting a bit of work into. You know. And this is our practice, samadhi, and the process of it. Process is as important as the settled state. It's not a matter of just pushing everything out of the way and and shutting everything down. It's a matter of processing through these what are called hindrances. Um, you know, ill will, sense desire, doubt, restlessness, worry, dullness, and learning from them, processing through. That uh, you find something very beautiful that acts as a source of, of self respect and comfort in your life. This is why we cultivate it. You know, surely, yeah, it's great if you can find 10 days, two weeks, a month to do it, but if you can find 15 minutes. Just carefully attending, carefully placing your thinking mind, carefully sensing what one breath feels like, carefully cultivating a quality of gratitude or contentment. If you have 15 minutes of it, you can benefit from it. When you see it's like that, yeah, then you also, 15 minutes of it are probably clear enough for you to be able to recognize all the other things that seem so important and pressing and got to do and in the way and no they're not hmm. that was just that was just the snowstorm you know that was just the sound of the wind blowing through my ears and we begin to feel the taste and the possibility of freedom this is why it's taught this is why it's encouraged it's taught because we can do it, and it's taught because we forget. So this is why it's taught. 
Igual. 